Good morning. We all, well, I'm hoping everybody can hear, hear me uh, and see me. Uh, my name's Marcus Jameson Pond. Um, I'm sure that some of you know me. I see that Lady Val has already raised her hand and Val and I go back a long way. Um, my background, I worked in, in HR and CSR for quite a few years before uh, going on to do other things. And I'm very pleased to be invited to host this session today for Culture Consultancy. So um, what I wanted to do today, before we get into the conversation properly, is first of all, just explain what we're going to do and then I'll give you some context. So we've got th three expert speakers who are going to address the subject of is CSR dead, how to embed social value through ESG. And uh, they're going to each in turn uh, talk about this subject, hopefully not too much about COP26. So I think we're probably all COP26 out at the moment. And that's only on day three. Um, and uh, we will uh, hear their points of view on that and then hopefully take some questions as well. Um, what I would say is that um, we will answer the questions that have been sent in to us first. Um, you are welcome to um, add to the chat, but we may not have time to actually get to that. Um, but what I would say is that um, the uh, culture consultancy are writing a white paper on this subject. So you should be in a position to actually see your input uh, added to that at some point. So um, just to kick it off, before we um, introduce you to the speakers, um, what I wanted to do is just quickly explain where CSR is coming from. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you can look back over time to the Victorians who set up model villages, and I think that was pretty much recognised as the first sort of CSR type activity in places like um, Norfolk, where the common factory uh, set up a model village, or Saltair in Bradford, or Bourneville, Cadbury's, oh. or Sunlight. And those were villages that were set up to really um, provide the workforce with a better environment. So those industrialists realised that um, business wasn't just about business, but it was also about making sure people were happy and uh, contented and had facilities available to them. So it was more than just what went on in the factories. Um, and then, of course, we had Milton Freeman in the 1950s who went against that and told us all that business was just about doing business and that um, all those add-on uh, societal benefits should be paid for through tax. Um, and I think that was a, a view that uh, sort of caused quite a lot of um, debate at the time. Um, but really, over the last 40 years, we've seen the rise of... Um, a greater awareness of how businesses can work within their communities um, and the wider wider world um, not only to generate income for shareholders but also um, for um, society more broadly so it was interesting i um, was listening to the today program this morning and um, heard alison rose who's the ceo say and i'll quote you uh, that uh, NatWest is now measuring emissions on our balance sheet. And it's interesting because 40 years ago, in 1981, Freer Speckley wrote a, a report called Social Audit, a Management Tool for Cooperative Working, uh, where he actually said that as part of full cost accounting, detrimental activities should be recorded as a liability. So in other words, uh, anything you do that's detrimental to the wider environment as well as society should be uh, included. So 40 years on, we finally got there by the sound of it. Um, so rather than me whittle on any longer, um, I'll pass us over to the expert panel. But I mean, fundamentally, what I think we're, we're looking to do today is to think about uh, whether CSR or CR or CRNS or ethical business or responsible business or ESG or social value or purpose um, is really now just part of doing business or whether it's a separate, uh, separate activity and requires separate thinking because there is an argument to say that we've gone full circle now and that these sorts of activities are just part of what we do on a day to day basis. So that then, then leads us to the question if it is part of just doing day to day basis, do we need to think about CSR as a, a separate thing or is it, just, is it just doing business? So is CSR dead? Well, that's a good question. So to start off with, before I introduce you to the panel, what I'm going to do is ask you the question, is CSR dead? So hopefully you've all got that, we'll have this on your screen. 
and you can just quickly click whether you think it's dead or you don't know or no or yes. Give you a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to answer that. Any more for any more? <laughs> okay. Well, we have a result. Um, it's a resounding no. CSR isn't dead. We've got 74 percent of you who think not. Four percent who say yes. And 22 don't know. So there we, go. there we are. Hopefully, you can see that. So um, thank you very much for that. That was that's interesting because I thought it'd be more evenly distributed. Um, so we're obviously speaking to a group of people who have a vested interest in CSR and they want it to survive. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pass you over now sorry, just up, to um, our expert panel. Um, and I'll introduce you uh, to them. Well, I'll, I'll yeah, give you the backgrounds in the order they're going to speak. So first of all, we've got Emma Cook, who's going to speak. And Emma is the head of responsible business at Herbert Smith Three Hills which is a, a global law firm, for those of you who are not aware. Um, and she leads across a range of responsible business globally. She's led the firm's citizenship strategy since 2013 and drives its current priorities, which are climate change, human rights, and community investment. She's passionate about the role businesses can play in driving change that creates an impact, making a real difference to people and places. She's a trained coach, has recently completed her MBA with Cranfield Business School. Emma holds various external positions, including the chair of a homeless charity called Julian House. So Emma will be speaking first, and then we'll go on to Jo. And Jo's got a bit of a bad back, so she may stand up halfway through her session. So uh, hopefully she'll be, she'll be okay and comfortable enough. So Jo Garrity is uh, formerly the head of HR for Goldman Sachs, France and Switzerland, with 16 years experience working in change management for various investment banks across the globe. She is the co-founder of Culture Consultancy and brings a wealth of practitioner experience to cultural projects of all shape and sizes. She is passionate about the importance of people engagement as a driver of customer excellence. She's also a speaker on high performance leadership, culture and employee experience, including productivity, innovation, inclusion and well-being. She was recognized in the 2017 Smith & Williamson Power 100 Index with her work to boost productivity through positive company culture. And together with Chris Beswick and Derek Bishop, Joe is the co-author of a book entitled Building a Culture of Innovation, which was in the top five management books on innovation in the 2017 CMI Management Book of the Year Awards, and is also an Amazon bestseller. Unlike my book, <laughs> which is, uh, is no one's bestseller, unfortunately, not, not number one but it's available in all good Amazon stores if you want to look it up. Anyway, cheap plug. We'll share the link, we'll share the link, Marcus. Oh, thank you. And then um, the um, third of our triumvirate is Nadia Al Yafe, who is the head of mutuality and impact at the Royal London Group, the largest mutual life insurance, pensions and investment company in the UK. She leads on the, the mutuality strategy, social impact and community agenda across the UK with a focus on driving social innovation and financial resilience. Nadia also works alongside the strategy division to develop and drive the wider purpose agenda. She is on the board of directors of the CR and S professional body, which is the Institute of CR and S, which I think Nadia will expand in when she gets to her session. And she believes now is the time for CR and S professionals to move beyond seat at the table to owning the table. So I give you your panel. And first of all, I think we're going to go over to Emma. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. And I think, oh, given on that poll, I'm definitely going to be talking to the converted because my um, little piece will be around about how CSR is not dead, um, which I see most of you agree with. So, so we're on to a good start. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my points are that CSR is not dead. I think now is the time more than ever for businesses to be responsible. Um, those that do not step up um, to their responsibilities to be a sustainable business will not survive. Their people won't stand for it. They won't be able to recruit talent. Um, their consumers or clients will be lost and also investment will be hard to come by. So I think now we're really seeing this huge wave of um, it is no longer just about profit. 
um, we do need to think about the responsibility of the businesses as well. However, that responsibility needs to be authentic. So I think no longer will consumers um, and civil society take the greenwashing and the kind of PR claims that have been made by big businesses in the past and have maybe kind of unfortunately damaged the reputation of CSR. I think other things have also damaged the reputation of CSR. I know that for years and years, I tried to shake off the reputation that all I did was bake sales. And I think throughout my entire career of kind of 16, 17 years, I may have attended a couple of bake sales, but I think I, I can't remember ever organizing one. So that has definitely not been part of my, my career, to, <laughs> career to date. But I do think that, um, that sometimes that CSR professionals, particularly those working in the community side do, unfortunately, get kind of bit of a reputation for just being the kind of bake sale and not very strategic in terms of the work that they're doing. Um, but technology has changed a lot over, over the years as well. So just in the short time that I've been working in, in the kind of CSR field, technology has changed just as it has done for the HR professions. When you look at kind of, when I started working, a HR team was called the personnel team and you went up and spoke to somebody in a kind of small office at the back of the building. Um, but now HR is much more kind of a part of the strategic driver of, of um, organisations. And I think just as the HR profession has changed, I think the CSR profession is changing as well. Um, and so being personally for myself, I've had a number of role titles over the years. Um, and it's ranging from kind of CSR manager, CR, citizenship, responsible business. Um, and that's been really a kind of reflection of how the chain, the times have changed, but also my kind of personal um, preference to kind of words that we should be using and the ways in which we should be describing ourselves um, internally as a team, but also externally with our stakeholders. A really common term that I see in role titles within the big big businesses, many of the FTSE is sustainability, but using it as a much wider term than just environment. So talking about the sustainability of the whole company. Um, and what I'd really like to see um, kind of coming out of some of the research and the surveys that, that do happen across the profession is a greater understanding of a convergence of the role titles, because I do think sometimes it's quite confusing and I have spent a long time in my career trying to explain what I do. Um, and it was only um, a couple of days ago I was watching um, Pointless and somebody um, was on there when they talk about their what they do as a job and someone said oh I'm a CSR manager and it was just great to see that kind of you know in public um, because of so many dinner parties and meetings that I've had I've had to explain what, what I do but I do think it's becoming more um, embedded in, in the mainstream now. Um, Marcus introduced me as the head of responsible business at Herbert Smith Freehills. I was actually recently promoted to director um, and my role hasn't actually necessarily changed, but what has changed is the kind of the recognition that the work that I'm doing is an important leadership role in the firm. Um, so although, yeah, absolutely delighted with that kind of promotion to director, it's not necessarily a particularly change. There wasn't somebody else in that role beforehand. It's just this kind of recognition that actually internally and externally, I am playing a key leadership role within the firm. The term ESG then, so um, for me, I see like the term ESG has been around for years and years and years. So I've been working in this field for a number of years and, and um, ESG has always been around within that investment space. And it's always been the way in which um, people like FTSE for Good or some of the investors would kind of look at analysing risk of investment. So it's not a new area, but it has definitely kind of grown in momentum and the amount of um, assets under management that have ESG um, criteria against them have grown exponentially over the last probably couple of, you know, the last couple of years, but has been growing for the last kind of 10 to 20 years. Um, but I do see that kind of term ESG more embedded in that kind of risk analysis and investor space. I know that it is becoming more mainstream and you'll hear from others today that, that have different opinions to me on that term around ESG. Um, but I am seeing a couple of my peers actually change their titles to head of ESG that were previously head of responsible business or sustainability or a whole kind of myriad of different titles. Um, but as I say, I think business strategy and CSR strategy now should be kind of one of the same. 
Um, we've also had a bad reputation, I think, over the years for being called a bolt-on or not embedded within the organisation. And I know that embedded is kind of one of the things that we want to talk a little bit about today. And I'll just touch on it, on it, on it briefly in a moment. But when I have spoken to any CSR practitioner or whatever you are calling it or whatever, whatever term you're familiar with um, at large companies, they will tell you that they've been working to embed practices within the company. And at times it's difficult. I've definitely had very difficult kind of conversations over the years and felt like I've been kind of pushing water up a hill, which is almost impossible. Um, and I'm sure many of you that are working in this space have had similar kind of experiences as well, um, where you're really seeking to embed something and push something forward, um, but it hasn't always been that, that, um, that easy. And you move on to the next challenge and the, ne and the next um, problem. But with this kind of wave of responsible business, the younger workforce asking more questions and being more demanding, um, consumers, client interests, I just don't think um, there is a, I think that it will be much easier for, for us to, to embed things because I think we'll, we're kind of, there's a more open door, more understanding, more um, awareness of the issues that we're thinking about. I also see the, the role of a CSR practitioner or whatever term you want to use as a real catalyst for change. So there have been a couple of projects that I've led and worked on at the firm, which we've taken through the team, the responsible business team, and then it's been embedded in the firm afterwards. We've kind of been that road tester to see whether it would work. And things like that are the living wage, um, so kind of being aware of the Living Wage Foundation through Citizens UK, which is one of the community organisations we are working with, an understanding of living wage, bringing that forward and getting us to be accredited as a living wage employer, and then moving that into the way we recruit our people, so ownership within HR, but then also ownership within the procurement team in terms of the way that we uh, work with our suppliers as well. So again, something that we've kind of brought in that we were aware of and then embedded it within the within the within the organization. Other examples of that uh, apprenticeship program. So we piloted uh, piloted the apprenticeship program way back before the levy was a was a thing. Um, and since since then over the many years it's now kind of owned and embedded within our HR teams and we have a a person responsible for apprenticeships but that kind of road testing and a catalyst for change is what I see as an important part of being a CSR team. Um, the, the areas under CSR as I'm sure many of you if you're working in that space are really vast so um, you could be working on anything from kind of human rights as, as Marcus said earlier in my bio human rights climate change social impact obviously there's the whole DNI space as well um, but there's also all the kind of the frameworks and things that are coming out from from many organizations and, and institutes. Um, I also work with pretty much every single department across the firm. So obviously I've mentioned HR in terms of the living wage and the apprenticeship stuff, but also working with our risk teams to think about what climate change looks like and the risk to the firm of climate change, our procurement team when we're thinking about buying things from minority owned businesses office ops when we look at our net zero strategy, our BD teams when we want to tell our clients about what we're doing and also our client facing teams because more and more now they are working with our clients on ESG areas, climate change areas, human rights areas um, and then of course our leadership team and that's not that's never changed I've always always worked closely with the, the leadership team on, on a variety of different topics. Um, but what we are seeing, I think, in this space, development of more hard law. And I think that's what we'll see as well over time. So we've had things like the Montsovi Act, which is also kind of, you know, introduced um, uh, areas of hard law into our areas and then things like the streamlined energy reporting as well. And I think that that will only continue, that kind of development of, of law and regulation, just as um, as things grow and, and continue and, and organisations are held more accountable. So I think... The people that are working in this area and have worked in these areas for a long time have a really unique skill set. They, um, I don't just talk about myself, I talk about all the peers and all the people that I've met along, along the way in my career. I think they've got fantastic networks 
kind of externally within the NGO community, UN, sustainable development goal stuff, but also tapped into the kind of consultancies and what they're talking about. Um, they bring with them kind of a really different point of view in terms of looking externally and a real kind of strategic thinkers. So a lot of the work that I do is horizon scanning and thinking about, okay, well, what's coming up in the future? How do we keep on top of everything? Um, a few years ago, it was looking at what's happening within the climate change agenda and making sure that we are following what's happening and seeing what's occurring and then being able to um, follow that and announce our own position on, on that as well. So it's so a good example is the kind of the growth of net zero and the science-based targets. So kind of being plugged into that and horizon scanning, thinking about that strategically and then mapping all of the stakeholders um, is a kind of great way just to kind of manage risk and, and opportunity. Anyway, the last piece um, I just wanted to briefly touch on was kind of how you embed things. So I think you need to firstly define what you're looking at. And a really good way of defining what you're looking at is to look at a framework. Um, so there are frameworks out there from kind of the B Corp um, impact assessment staff, the global reporting initiative, you know, whatever, choose a framework, think about what best practice looks like, and then think about what is material to your business, because not everything in those frameworks is going to be material, and not everything in those you're going to want to be able to focus on kind of straight away. And then think about how you will be judged. So what are your stakeholders looking at? What are your people saying? What are your press saying? What are your clients saying? Um, that will really help you kind of narrow it down and talk to your stakeholders, both internally and externally. Um, and once you've got a kind of clear idea of the things that you want to embed, think about accountability, ownership, and reporting. So don't do any, you won't be able to do anything as a single person within an organization, because it's very difficult to, to achieve that. You really need to embed it into all of the processes, um, teams, all, heads, you know, whatever departments across the business. So really think about that accountability at a kind of functional level, but also at a, a very senior level as well. And who is going to own it to make sure that they know that you're not going to own it, that they're owning it. You're the expert and the advisor and bringing forward some of the kind of external thinking. Um, and then how are you going to report on it? How are you going to make sure that any of these goals or targets or anything that you've set out to do how are you going to report on it and make sure that you're holding yourself accountable so anyway i think my 10 minutes might be up i think marcus might so start much. waving at me but i am um, put <clears throat> yeah great <laughs> brilliant thank you ever so much uh, thank um, you very much. It, it was, well first of all congratulations on your promotion and secondly thank you for the extra couple of minutes of the polls of wisdom you added at the end um just to say, I noticed that some people are asking for um, the information that we're talking about. So uh, book references and frameworks that you've just mentioned as well. And I think the plan is for um, Culture Consultancy to get in touch with everybody who's been on the call and provide those links at some point. So uh, don't yeah. worry if you didn't write it all down. There's also a recording of this being done as well. So I'm going to pass you over now to, to Joe. Um, take it away, Joe. Joe, you've got... Um, 10 minutes there or thereabouts if you want to be quicker that's that's fine with me <laughs> excellent okay well there's lots of things that i agree with so with emma so thanks emma um i definitely agree that you know responsible business is here to stay and is only going to become more important i think you know we, we segment people into their um generational blocks too much but i do think that the younger generations now are more focused than any, any generation generation before them. So I just think it's going to become more and more on the agenda. Um, but whether you're, uh, but CSR is definitely having a, some sort of terminology uh, issue. <laughs> I do think that maybe that needs to change as uh, for what it's called, but we'll figure that out. Maybe we should come up with our own new title at the end. Um, the key is whether you're calling it, whether your focus is on CSR or on ESG or, or something else, um, is to ensure that the approach has changed. So I think as Emma alluded to, the bad rap for, for CSR often came from this kind of very activity-led, you know, community-based sort of scatter, broad brush approach to just doing stuff. You know, I remember myself in corporate life painting fences and I didn't quite do the bake sale, but but it was this sort of activity piece and it and, and everything was measured on how many hours did we do and how many, how much of our, our time or how much cash did we give or um 
And that's that's no longer a good enough measurement. You know, whatever we do now, whatever we call it, has to be impact focused. It has to be how much have we moved the dial? How much positive change have we created with what we're doing? Um, and the best way to do that is obviously to, to make it a more strategic initiative, to focus it on the longer term uh, you know, social impact that, that you want to have. Uh, not that everything can happen overnight, obviously, but but to, to bake that into to what you're doing. So really demonstrate, you know, how, how and where you're moving the needle. Um, what we are seeing, though, obviously, we work across lots of different uh, types of organisations, industries, sectors, sizes, everything. Um, we're, we're seeing a real shift towards ESG. So as we go into assess cultures or design them or embed them, we're often looking at ESG alongside alongside that so bringing those pieces together um, and I think even in just the last couple of years there's been a real shift away from that okay this is just in the investment box it's it's, it's something that we're doing for potential investors or for existing shareholders or it, you know it's something that we need to in our annual report to look pretty to actually becoming part of, of business strategy uh, and culture and the CSR piece seems to be more of the engine that's making that happen. Um, so still where the activity is, but, but more measured and more structured by the ESG piece. Um, so when I say integrated into the culture, I think it's one of those funny things, you know, I've been culture change for 12 years now. Um, and there's still this piece around, well, culture is just you know, it's just the purpose and the values, or it's just it's just the bits that are plastered on the wall. And I think it is. It, it, I mean, not, not entirety. I mean, I think it is the purpose and the values, but fully embedded. Like, you know, they have to be in complete alignment. That purpose piece is so key. You still see a lot of people writing ESG strategy as one piece that they want to achieve, and and company purpose and values are something completely different. So that piece needs to be completely aligned. Um, it does need to be embedded. I know that's a big word and I know it's difficult to do, but it's not impossible. So really embedded into, into the everyday working practices of your company, um, underpinning all the decisions that are made, uh, you know, across all the different, well, hopefully there aren't silos, but, you know, across all the different groups. So it affects your HR policy, affects your procurement um standards it affects you know every, everything that you're doing and that there aren't any pockets that are left untouched so you will often get uh something like partner or supplier selection has its own little bucket that isn't impacted by esg or csr at all and, and runs on its own wheels and that can't be like, all of those different business processes need to be uh, it needs to be fully integrated with that and, and it needs to be embedded in one um also how it directs employee performance so if you're if you're embedding it into the culture and you're saying that it becomes everybody's responsibility which it should be and not just sitting with with the top team or one particular one particular group then it has to be um it has to direct em employee um how employee performance performance is, is managed. And I think even if you take the classic, you know, Netflix deck quote of, you know, it determines who gets promoted, rewarded and let go, you're kind of on, on the right path, I think. So those, those pockets of bad behaviour that sometimes still exist where you say, well, actually, it applies to most people, but because this is a special group, they are revenue generators or they are protected in some other way, this behavior that we're asking for, this attitude is, is not required here, can't exist anymore. You can't allow for those pockets. Um, and lastly, it needs to be central to your innovation strategy. So sometimes when we go in, we see this kind of huge disconnect between the culture, ESG, um, you know, innovation and, and business strategy, and the things are kind of disconnected. And that's where this, there's got to be this, this joining up uh, you know, bringing everything together so there's there's just one strategy that all of those things sit in um so how do you embed i think we're back onto the holy grail i'm sure we're going to get more questions on this but from our perspective really it, it starts with leadership and i think the way the way that the leaders need to be to drive this forward in a meaningful way has got to change so 
the hiring the right leaders, you know, conscious, purposeful, ethical leaders, equipping them with the right information that they need, with the right skills to lead in this environment, I think is going to be key. I think finding people who truly believe in social responsibility and social impact. So the, the days of paying lip service or being half interested are, are long gone. I think it, it, it has to be a, a genuine desire. Um, you know, there's a lot talked about authenticity in the leadership space, but it's very difficult to be authentic, something like this, if you don't genuinely believe in what you're saying. So you, you have to be genuine about it. Um, I feel quite, I don't think I mentioned that, I feel quite heartened really about some of the conversations that have happened recently. I think just the last even sort of 12, 18 months, there's been a real shift in, um, yes, I sort of believe in this, um, but can you just get me something that looks good in our pitch deck and that we can put on the website? I just, I just need some words. We will make it happen, but can I get some words for now through to actually, you know, I'm the CEO of a fairly sizable business and I'd like to tackle inequality in society, which is a little bit like saying I'd like to boil the ocean, right? I mean, that's that's huge ambition, <laughs> but you have to admire that because if that's a genuine desire, you can at least go some way to addressing it. Um, and that that kind of thing really excites me that I feel like people are, you know, actually striving for that. Can I make a difference? Can my company, yes, we can do lots of work internally, but if we do all this great stuff, can we actually make a difference? Um, Another one that we saw recently that I liked when we were doing a values uh, design session was about long termism. You know, how can you embed long termism as a value across the business? And that's actually really interesting when you start to break it down into all those component parts, into all the departments. So quite excited about that. So, yeah, the first one's definitely leadership. Um, the second one is really about engaging and enabling your people. So I think ESG in particular has had this kind of box that it's been sitting in. If people are now trying to bring that into, no, we're going to make, you know, we're going to build a culture of ESG, how do you engage people in, in making that a reality? And it's all very well having the sort of, uh, you know, high level direction of travel. Here's our vision. This is where we're trying to go to. But breaking that down into, okay, we've got our long term goal, but what's the medium term goal? And what are actually the daily nudges? What are the things that we can do day to day to make this a reality you know so that people can really say oh actually i'm i'm making a difference what the work that i do is is tangibly making a difference and that will keep people on track with, with what they need to do um and then thirdly is really around data and, and metrics and i think getting the right metrics in place to demonstrate impact and this this is not very easy often even in the diversity and inclusion space you know employees don't have to give you their diversity data so even internally trying to say that you've that you've made some change um, but there there are ways to to encourage them further to you know to build trust to explain them to you know educate them on why you need that to you know engage in what you're going to do with it so we run quite a lot of campaigns where of course we can't force people but if you can engage them in why you want it and what you're going to use it for then you've got a better chance of, of getting them into that um, and lastly, just yeah, building it into your employee value proposition at every stage of the life cycle. So even from even from the time before you're recruiting them, it's a bit like the leadership piece. You know, the, the leaders need to be fully on board with it. But really, you want all of your employees to be values driven. You want them you want them to share your values before they even walk in the door. Um, so so just getting them to to have that in a real Marcus is winding me up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just say, yeah, so, you know, it, it's much, it's very difficult for people to change their personal values. So much better to find people whose values are already aligned than to try and change them further down the line. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Joe. Um, I feel terrible about cutting people short when they've got so much to say. <laughs> I'm sure that each of you it's probably a good thing. We'll go, we'll go on for hours. Otherwise. I think you could probably each talk for about three hours. So we'll have to do a whole full day session next time. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll pass you over to Nadia, um, who has the, the difficult position of following the last two. So uh -huh. it's, it's finding something else to say that hasn't been said already before, or I perhaps reinforcing what's been said. So, <laughs> yeah. 
So hi, everybody. I'm Nadia Yafai. I am the head of mutuality and impact at Royal London Group, as Marcus said, and we're the UK's largest financial services mutual. Um, and we're a customer owned company. We don't have shareholders, which I think has really helped us kind of embed and drive this agenda um, as an organization. So um, I'll try, I'll do exactly what Marcus has said, which is, yes, I'm going to echo a lot of what people have said. And I think specifically, uh, Emma and I have been both around for a long time and have known each other a long time as well. So I'd echo a lot of what she said. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the um, agenda, Royal London, which has also moved from um, the social impact piece uh, and now into our purpose agenda. So in terms of terminology, we use the terminology around purpose and that's kind of the enabler in the business. Um, so. Uh, a little bit about my role and, and the kind of different things that I would see within the CSR function. Um, I uh, oversee our social innovation community programs, but I'm also the business lead on our purpose agenda, so the SME on that. But that's a strategy owned deliverable and a CEO owned deliverable, but I am the SME that, that sort of drives that, brings that outside in look and kind of really builds on the knowledge that, that I've gained through the, the many, many years in this field to really help us understand how does that outside in societal piece impact the business and how does it then become a commercial driver for the business? I think that's really critical because the, thinking about things as a commercial driver is not a bad thing. It's about understanding what is the value of this to the business? Where does it sit? And actually, how can you use it as an innovator going forward for the business to grow, for it to communicate with its customers? Um, I sit within brand and comms, so a lot of my work is also around how do we bring this into our comms? How do we communicate the things that we want to drive change on to kind of bring people on the journey? So for me, I think it's a real positive that the way we think about it and the, and the kind of direction of travel for my role has become very much strategic and very much around sitting at that table. And I do think it's come a long way from um, bake sales and, and all the rest of it. Um, but I'm also a board director at ICRS, um, which is the Institute of uh, Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability. And um, I should say that the view on it from the ICRS is that obviously ICRS focuses on the uh, skills and competencies you need to kind of undertake the widest role in this space, whatever it's called in your business. And um, but actually what's interesting is our membership is all the way from community to ESP to CR with to different entry points and different focuses. And I, my personal view is that um, it's actually that piece around focus that is a really critical piece for um, CSR and the maturity of CSR. Like CSR, as, as everyone has said, it used to be a standalone function. It used to be something that's probably reported on once a year in the annual report. I do think that's probably phasing out. But to say it's dead is probably to suggest that we've reached maturity. And I don't think that's the case in most organizations. I'd say that it's high on the agenda for consumers. And if you look at things like the Edelman Trust Barometer and things like that, it really demonstrates that trust in business is still low, um, despite the fact that business is trying hard and kind of very vocal about topics, regardless about kind of where they are on the spectrum of, of what they're truly delivering. But I, I do think that actually one of the things about business and, and CSR and social value is there are so many issues for a business to tackle so everything from social mobility, inequality, gender, race, climate, intersectionality of all those issues. And I think the challenge is how to know what to make a difference on. And that twin rise of the purpose agenda and climate agenda has kind of ramped up the role of the professional in this space. And that kind of purpose issue is now at a C-suite level. And I, I, I suspect that the role of the CSR professional has been, as Emma said, we've been having these conversations and having this approach and having that kind of wider stakeholder engagement piece for all of our careers. That is how we do our jobs really well. And that is how we embed uh, whatever it is from volunteering to you know, community engagement all the way through to purpose. But I think it's those learnings about how you engage that, how you drive change, how you understand the issues to focus on, that is the real value of the CSR professional. No, because that's what that's at the heart of the role is influencing knowledge and kind of long-termism is such a deep part of that. The reporting changes, I think, have been really interesting because actually reporting has helped drive that agenda and kind of get the business involved. Um, and the education piece, I think, is really critical as well. So one of the things I do is I induct all our board members um, into what we're doing in this space. And I think that, that our board members are already really brilliant people because we are a, a mutual. So they're coming to an organization that's already quite open in this space. But it's around how do you enable 
everybody to think about what is that focus area that we should sort of really drive change on. So a little bit about, um, about the journey for us and that kind of twin piece around where does the CSR professional finish and where does the strategy team begin is actually, I think, quite an interesting one. So like a lot of us have started in community, but within a year I was working with the CEO on our wider social impact agenda, uh, looking at programs that are around social innovation on the issues that, that we are, think are critical. And then I started working with strategy on the purpose agenda. So purpose agenda is very much a strategy deliverable in the business driven by our CEO. But actually the knowledge that I have of things like um, how do you develop the commitments that you will drive on? How do you look at the KPIs for that? How do you drive, provide customer and societal outcomes on the issues? How do you even identify the issues that matter to you? Those are all, those have all come out of learnings that I've had through developing a social impact program within our kind of uh, division. And taking that kind of step, stepped approach of, you know, you kind of come up with an overarching purpose, then you identify the key areas that you focus on. So for us, those areas are around helping build financial resilience and moving fairly to a sustainable world. And what I've done then is subsume a lot of the work around social impact that I've already driven um, and pulled that into the purpose work. So what that means is a lot of that focus now sits at the strategic level. So then the conversations that I'm having are much more around our propositions and, and how we build that into our propositions, around our customer engagement and how we kind of drive customer engagement on things like how they build financial resilience, um, how we map it into our people. So thinking about the cultural agenda and, and there's a big piece around how do you enable your people to really understand when you talk these kind of high fluted social drivers and, and big things you're trying to change in society, how do you enable your people when they sit at their desk every single day to understand the link between what strategy is talking about, what CEOs are talking about, and what you do day to day? And I think that's actually a really big piece of the puzzle is if you can crack, if you can choose the right focus areas and make them really meaningful to the business and to the core business that you do, and then help people on that journey that long-term journey to understand how every single person's job contributes and help them articulate it. Actually, I think that helps drive culture and change and purpose across the business. And there's a kind of stepped approach, I guess, which is as well, that you really need to drive change for your customers because they are absolutely your biggest stakeholders. But by doing that, you are they are then in society. Customers, all of us live in society. So how do you understand what the societal issues they are facing are? And how do you then support them in tackling those? I think there's a really big part to play in terms of the social contract of business to kind of really get involved in that. Um, I obviously am a big proponent of the value of the CSR professional, whatever they're called. So I guess my urge would be, if you're grappling with these issues and you're not a CSR professional, go find your CSR professional or bring one in because they have been doing this for many years. And and they, the speed at which a CSR professional, whatever they're called, will pull your business through is actually pretty incredible because the, the, they understand the societal and environmental drivers. And I guess your role is then to help them communicate it to the right way to become a commercial driver. I will draw that to a close. And, and probably my last point to say is that um, I do actually think that CSR is obviously not dead, um, and that's probably a given, but I do think that it has now become a real commercial driver. And I guess the balance is how do you enable it to be a commercial driver and drive change both in your products, your services, your customer approach, and in what you do in society, but also how do you enable the business to take that long-term view and understand that actually driving impact takes time. Fascinating, and, and well done for not repeating everything that's been said before. Um, so we've we've got a few um, a few minutes to ask the panel some questions, um, and I've got a long list here. I think a lot of them have already been answered or, or touched on by our speakers already. So um, my question, I mean the first question really for the three of you to think about is: there are a lot of terms that are used to describe this thing that we know as CSR. Um, you know, we talked about you know it, it changed to CR at one point when. Um, Digging holes and painting fences was sort of deemed to be more volunteering and team building. Um, and then we've looked at various iterations and we're up to ESG at the moment and people are talking about social value as well. And I, I just wonder, you know, to the outsider, does it look confused or should we sort of define it as one particular thing? So I don't know who wants to take that first, Emma, maybe? Yeah, sure. Happy to comment. 
I think it's really confusing. I think I've definitely struggled when thinking I don't want to be known as a CSR, like I don't want my job title to be CSR, and then struggle to think about what else it should be. Um, I would really call on, I think there needs to be some research into what terms people are using, and then a convergence of those terms. I think that would be helpful for, for CSR practitioners and any of those people working in the space, because I think it is so muddled and mixed. Um, what's included in the roles is also very different in, for different organisations. So as I say, some of it's because it's what's material to your business, but others may have, for example, environment may be sat in a different area of the business or d &I may be a separate kind of team. So I think, yeah, greater clarity and convergence of role titles into a kind of more standard approach would be really helpful for the profession. And, and Nadi, does the uh, does the institute have a view on this? Have you ever discussed it? Does that interest? Yeah, actually. So we have, um, and I, I think that I think that the big challenge is that it, it kind of depends a little bit on the maturity of the business as well in terms of how does the business understand that? Because you're you're not just talking about CSR professionals choosing their own title. You're also talking about a title that then the business buys into and. Mm -hmm understands where it sits so similar to Emma my title has gone from from community corporate responsibility and now I'm head of mutuality which as a mutual that's that's the kind of it demonstrates that strategic shift of where my role sits and and what the value is um, and actually they've dropped we dropped um we I was social impact I chose social impact um because I really like that kind of focus as in terms of showing the business what the program enables us to deliver uh, and actually, as Emma says, it's moved on and responsible business has, has even moved on now. Um, but we've even dropped the social and it's just around impact. So I, I would say that there's a twin bit is how do you convince the business to future proof the title and give it a, a, the space to grow is probably part of the challenge. So if, if someone is thinking about that, I would say the biggest challenge is to get a title in place that allows you to grow as you show and demonstrate the value of what's possible within that role. Because otherwise, it's not just there's so many titles, it's that the type that your title keeps changing. And I don't think that's the best thing. But I will take the challenge on behalf of the ICRS in terms of um, titling. We've we certainly had that conversation before, but I think a lot of people are quite wedded to certain titles. Mm. <laughs> and Joe, you must, you must come across different job title people on your travels. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I, I, agree, I agree with both of the panellists. I think it, it leads to another point, actually, about size and scale is that any size of company shouldn't put off, be put off by doing something. So we, we talked about big ambition and boiling the ocean, but actually, whatever you call it and whatever you're doing can be proportionate to your actual business size. The important piece is that you're doing something and you're doing something meaningful. So better to do something small, I think, as a business and, and and move the needle in a particular space. You know, I saw Lady Val's on the on the chat for argument's sake. So if if that's if you were going to take prison reform and you were going to say that's our that's our CSR, you know, focus, then you try and make a change in that in that one area. I think sometimes companies are put off by the fact that it does look so big and complicated and it's called all sorts of things and they feel like the expectation is is huge rather than just saying, right, let's just do this one thing, stick at it for the long term and, and make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do you think that um, with regards to sort of focusing on one thing, you know, should that be something that comes from within the business or from within your client base? From within your business and your client base? I guess it comes back to the, to the purpose strategy piece again. So I'm guessing that you'll have set that with thinking who do we want to be and, and what do we want to achieve? And that's that's partly serving your clients, partly serving your employees, potentially your shareholders. So I guess there's a mix of stakeholders that you have to factor factor into that. Um, I don't know what the others think, but Nadia, is that your hand? Yeah. So we've been on a really big journey around the purpose and the kind of focus areas that we've chosen. And, and I'm a really big believer in, I, I remember listening to someone very, uh, I think it was, um, yeah, some, someone very senior within um, uh, CR many years ago. And they said to me that they initially had something like 10 commitments, but if they did it again, they would only have 
uh, two to three commitments. And I really took that to heart because when we first developed our social impact commitments, there were 10 of them across everything from our propositions, responsible investment, community, um, people agenda, et cetera. And actually when we got down to choosing our purpose impact areas, and there was a big team behind that choosing it, not just myself, but we had stakeholders across the business. We had, we thought about what our customers wanted. We did purpose workshops to kind of develop the purpose. In, and actually the whole business was kind of really involved in that. We ended up articulating the two that we have now, and and I am and I was very happy to subsume our ten commitments into just two focus areas, and I think it just really helps drive conversations really well. And more importantly, actually, because we're now working on thinking about outcomes and metrics, it helps drive the outcomes and metrics. Because I think the challenge for if I think about someone sitting at their day job, the challenge when you throw so much of this that the business cares about at them is focus. It's how does this fit with what I'm doing now? And do I focus on this or do I focus on something that the people team has told me around leadership or do I focus on you know, something our customers are trying to drive, do I focus on our products? So actually just having one or two really key focus areas that you understand that issue, you go deep into it and you understand how everything in your business contributes to it, I think is incredibly powerful. And I'd probably suggest is absolutely the focus of where we're moving going forward. I mean, looking at your website, your corporate website, Emma, you you know you place great emphasis on talking about your CSR credentials. So obviously that's an advert, isn't it? It's a it's a shop window to your your client base. It's a law firm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think as a number of these topics have risen up on the agenda, they're important to our client base as well. So our clients want advice. You know, as I mentioned, lots of moving from voluntary to kind of legal and hard law. So and as a law firm our clients want that advice on whether it's changes in climate change law or climate change litigation or human rights modern slavery act how do they comply um yeah and, and and much broader so we used to have an impact investing practice that we launched when impact investing kind of started and advising our clients on that area and we had a climate change um practice group and that's all kind of morphed together now in a kind of esg practice where we where we kind of advise on a whole range of different issues but yeah our client base we recently published um a report called responsibility incorporated i think that's what it's called <laughs> hopefully i've got that wrong um where we spoke to lots of general counsel in our client base and they're absolutely saying that this is a, a key area for them sorry joe i cut you short no that's okay i was just saying there's a real, the, I agree with the focus that I, in the back of my mind, there's this real risk about for everybody, the focus, one the main focus is probably going to have to be climate sustainability and net zero, right? That's going to dominate the next 10 years of our lives for sure, right? if not longer. And that's probably right. I'm sure that's right. But at the same time, there's a real risk that we neglect other areas that also need focus. Uh, like diversity and inclusion and well-being and other things so I think it's just that trying to trying to make sure that we you know yes we put the main focus where it should be but that we don't neglect the other things that need attention. Yeah I, I agree I mean obviously at the moment uh, what's going on in Glasgow is informing everything we're, we're hearing on the news and um, back in the day I mean I used to do a bit of environmental stuff which was kind of a conversation with the facilities guys <laughs> not much more um and i'm sure if i was still doing csr now i'd be thinking oh my god you know it's all going to be environmental from now on and uh, all the other good stuff's going to go out the window um so i mean what, what do you think the next challenges for csr esgr i mean over, you, you say over the next 10 years joe the environment's going to be high on the agenda but i mean what, what's coming down the line what's looking what's on the horizon i know one of you said you horizon scanning i think that was emma uh, what, what are the issues going to be Emma, do you want to go first on that one? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think there'll be more hard law. I think we'll see more regulation, more red tape, more reporting requirements for businesses. Um, as an LLP, we're not always um, captured in some of the kind of um, companies act and the, the requirements of companies, but I see that changing. More regulation now requires LLPs to also be reporting. So things like around environment, it's like TCFD, um, and all that kind of regulation, as well as these modern slavery acts that I was mentioning earlier. So I think we'll see that. I also think we'll see, um, uh, there are a lot, I mentioned a few different frameworks earlier. So there are lots of kind of different frameworks out there, ways of measuring organizations. And a lot of that has been voluntary and there's been a big growth in the investment community kind of measuring ES 
ESG factors, um, but there is no common like accounting mechanism. You know, if you look at accounting, you, there's, there's a way of methodology in which how you measure your, your, your finances. I think there'll be a big push in the coming years of those frameworks. And, and I don't know which one will come out on top, but you see things coming out of the World Economic Forum and the big four accountancy firms and trying to put together a kind of framework of measuring what this looks like so that all firms can compare what we're doing. And Nadia, briefly, do you have a view on this? What's coming down the line? Um, I wonder if it's things around intersectionality of issues. So actually picking up on what you've both said, um, one of the things that troubles me is I wonder how we make sure that the climate and the social impact of that is, is kind of equal, because actually the climate agenda has an intersectionality around poverty and mental health and biodiversity and all these kind of race issues and so on. And I, looking down the line, I think our, our job as, as professionals is to kind of keep that balanced weighting of what's coming down the line and not, and not letting the conversation just go one way, because actually DNI will will fall down, well-being will fall down, as you say. Other bit that comes to mind is governance, actually governance of business. And um, I think someone had mentioned things like B Corp, but actually beyond that, there are all kinds of kind of look, uh, the BBA, things like looking at, at section 172, um, mm -hmm. director's duties, all the rest. So I think all those will really, really increase. And then our boards will have to kind of take more and more interest in that and, and drive that change. Great, um, I'm conscious of time and um, it's, it's interesting to have those thoughts at the end about what's coming down the line. Um, I, I remember, I mean, just to give, share something with you, when I first started doing this in 2006, I had a, an HR manager who came to me and said, you are our Jiminy Cricket. Uh, I said, well, what's that supposed to mean? She said, you know, Jiminy Cricket was, was Dumbo's conscience. He used to sit on Dumbo's shoulder and tell him what to think. Um, and I think in many respects, you know, things haven't really changed. You know, we, as, as professionals, you know, we're all still there keeping the business focused on what's really important. So, um, you know, all power to your elbows. Um, <laughs> conscious, we, we said we're going to finish at 12. I was going to rerun the poll very quickly. So for those of you who are still with us, um, let's just have a closing poll and I'll ask the same question. Is CSR dead? And let's see, see if we've got any change in our thinking. I do think that coming down the line is also going to be the, the real mindset shift, you know, the mindset shift and behaviour change that's required. So I think it's all very well talking about net zero, but when people actually look at what that means on a personal and company level, I think it's quite... Well, the good news is that um, our panel of experts have persuaded us. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it's far from dead. <laughs> it's alive and kicking. And a couple of us, you know, maybe we, we think it is, uh, you haven't changed their minds, but uh, all we don't know is have definitely moved across to support you. So, so well done you three, you know, you've done your job today um, and you can carry on working in, in the profession. It's not safe to um, so thank you very much everyone for attending today. It's been fascinating. It's been uh, brilliant for me to, to get involved as well. Thank you for that. Um, as I said, I think Joe and the team are planning to uh, release this recording on YouTube or wherever it is they post it uh, and on top of that they're in the process of writing this white paper around the subject uh, which will pose similar questions and, and hopefully the questions we haven't had a chance to to ask uh, will uh, be included in that as well and you never know we might end up doing a part two to this because uh, obviously it's a hot subject uh, not talking about the environment there okay, so thank you very much Marcus Emma Nadia thank you for your time Thank you.